No matter what the ethnicity or race or religion, I wanted to be on the right side of history. I wanted to be for human rights in general. So I, mean, I realized that there is a power in being a woman with a voice and with confidence. Hello, my name is Diana Sharo. Welcome to Dao. Today, my guest is an international host, Miss Philippines Earth 2018, Zahra Bianca Saldua. Zahra was born in Jordan to a Palestinian mother and a Filipino father. Being born in such a multicultural family showed her very early that there can be more similarities than differences. Her main goal now is raising the awareness about important social problems in the world and building multicultural bridges. I wish you a pleasant view. Hello Zahra, thank you so much for finding time for this dialogue. Um, I'm very happy to have you here. And so we have a big distance because you are in Philippines currently, I'm in the Netherlands. So thank you very much for finding this time. Welcome to Dialogue. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm really excited to be a part of this, this show and I'm so happy to be sharing my story and to have this amazing conversation with someone from across the world. I really love meeting new people and your show has been so amazing. I've been watching it for the past few days saying, oh, I hope I don't mess up this <laughs> Thank you so much. When I was thinking about how should I start my conversation with you, I thought that like you were a person who was like playing on the contrasts. Uh, we'll talk about this, yeah? And, uh, but do you remember what was your dream uh, job when you were a child, what you were dreaming about? Actually, the very first time that I had a definite dream was when I was 10 years old, because of course, when you're a child, you think you want, you want to be everything in the world. And I was very outgoing. So I tried all types of clubs from sports, cooking, ballet, everything. But at 10 years old, I remember I, tell, I told my parents that I wanted to become a United Nations ambassador. I wanted to become a lawyer for human rights and be a part of the international community to help other people do amazing things or to at least get into having a better life. Because when I think about that type of job, I really wanted three things. The first one was to travel, to meet new people, of course, from different cultures, different traditions. And the second would be the opportunity to earn good money because from what I understood, being a part of the United Nations or any diplomatic role had good money involved. And third was to help people. So I felt like that was the real essence of why I wanted that type of job. Mm -hmm. and, and what like, what was actually, what was your uh, first um, focus on your education when you finished your school? So what was the, the departments that you choose? When I studied in college or university, I took communications actually. And I decided that this is a very good course for me since I love to talk. And of course, it will help me if ever I choose to advance in law or any other field. And lo and behold, I was able to get into hosting. It started when I was 16 years old. I really did a lot of odd jobs like writing. I became a PA or personal assistant. I also became a production manager. I made coffee for the directors and the artists and the talents. And I also did a lot of research and script writing as well and even editing. So I was more behind the camera. And then at 16, 17, I started becoming exposed to be more in front of the camera. Yeah. And ever since then, that became the beginning of my career. I didn't realize that using my voice and speaking for for different types of events, whether it's sports or a social event like weddings or birthday parties or anniversaries, and even into charity events and government or public service type of events, that allowed me to do the three things I wanted, which is to meet new people, to, to help others, and of course, to earn good money at the same time. So that really became my focus moving forward 16 years later this is what i'm doing as well amongst other things 
Yeah, and, and coming a few steps before, because you come from a multicultural family. So can you please say like a little bit about the history of your, your family? And uh, I'm, I think you were not born in Philippines, right? So what was the, the whole story behind it? <laughs> Yeah, I only moved here in 2005. I was 13 years old at the time. And when I, when I was born, my family was in Jordan and my father is actually pure Filipino and my mother is pure Palestinian. They met in Kuwait and I was conceived in Italy when they moved to Italy for a year and then I was born in Jordan. So it was definitely a whirlwind type of love story for my parents. And when I came into the picture, we stayed in uh, Jordan since most of my mother's family were staying there. They are 10 brothers and sisters. I think the majority and my grandparents decided to move to Jordan since it was less complicated and closer to my other family members in Palestine. So that's the background. And like you said, very multicultural. Even if I were in the Middle East, I still had a Filipino community. So both of both worlds were very much ingrained in who I am and yeah. the cultures I was exposed to really made me see that we're not so different as human beings although there are certain differences but those differences just made us unique but the similarities made us so i didn't even realize that we were that different to the point that there would be an issue yeah but that's great because i think when you grew up in a multicultural family that actually um, makes your horizon wider, right? Because you really, you know, it, it's already from the beginning on you have this bonus that you see the world not just from one side. And I think this is a great, uh, great chance. I mean, I'm also born in a multicultural family and, I, and actually now I understand that this is a great experience. So, and um, how did you take the decision, decision to participate in Miss Philippines Earth? So, how did you come to this point? Actually, when it came to pageantry, I never really thought that I would be a beauty queen because of course when you first think about beauty queens and beauty pageants, you have this connotation where, oh, the women there are just meant to be beautiful, not really meant to use their brains, <laughs> right? But uh, in two th 2013, I joined Miss World Philippines at first and this was because I felt like, you know what, this is a great opportunity. I have a newfound confidence in myself and people were telling me I should join. Let's see where this is going to take me and if this is really a platform where I can push for certain projects or for, uh, certain programs and help more people. And I realized that that was the time when I became this new woman of knowing how to do makeup, knowing how to present myself in a different way. Because again, it's two worlds. I was very tomboyish, I was very rowdy and uh, very outspoken, but I now knew how to play a more feminine role and I took, it, I took advantage of that. It was not something that I was ashamed of anymore, but something that I embraced. And during Miss World, I realized that beauty queens are a great Plat uh, beauty contests or pageants are great platforms because once you have a sash and a crown, people will actually listen to you more. I think it's the same where if you are an athlete, an international athlete, they'll also listen to you more because you have that credibility that you're representing the country or you're representing a, a group of people. And when I went into Miss Philippines Earth, I was already 27, so that was 22 years old. Fast forward to 27 with Miss Philippines Earth, and I said, this is my last chance since beauty pageants have a an age limit. I, this is my last chance. I really want to do something with, with the platforms that I have. I really want to push for it, and if you get that, that crown, although second runner-up, first runner-up is not so bad, but if you get that crown, it will really make a big difference in not only my life, but in the lives of the people that I really wanted to help. So that's how I went into Miss Philippines Earth or pageantry in general, because like I said, I w it was never my dream to be a beauty queen, but the power of being a beauty queen was what, was what I was really looking forward to, because it was a stepping stone to help me do more things. And I think I'm grateful for that type of experience. And how did you feel when you became a beauty queen? <laughs> Do you remember this feeling that day? I, I honestly was shocked. I didn't realize that I could be this type of person, you know? <laughs> 
but like I said, I, I embraced it and I really felt my womanhood. Because before, I think when I was younger, I always said, boys get to do this, boys get to do that. But then when I became a beauty queen, I realized that there is a power in being a woman with a voice and with confidence. And that those moments where I was on stage, I was feeling myself. I was really <laughs> so happy to be on that stage and uh, more so when I was in the Q&A portion because that was my chance to not only show how beautiful or how amazing my body looks, but more about how I thought and what I really wanted to share with the world. But were you, were you afraid to become too feminine that you decided to go to the army afterwards? <laughs> How did this decision come? <laughs> because this is like a playing on the contrast. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, people think that it's a whole 360 because I switched my heels to my combat boots, right? Yes. Um, people are always saying, oh my God, you're a beauty queen and then you're you're part of the Philippine army as a, as a reservist. I said, if you look at it in terms of its essence, right? The whole reason why I joined the beauty pageant industry was because I wanted a platform to help my my people. But then I joined the army because it is a platform to helping people. People think that if you're in the army, your number one initiative or your one, number one goal is to be in war or to carry guns. But more than what that is, it's actually peace building and community building. And that's what I wanted to be a part of. So to me, the essence never really left, but aesthetically, the way you look at it, it's completely <laughs> different. It is, it is for sure, but it makes your personality even more interesting because you know that, that that's really great because I think, you, you know, you found this beauty and strength together and that, that, that that's a pretty, you know, uh, it doesn't happen so often, but it's really, really nice. And um, like you said that you wanted to work with the United Nations and there are a lot of social issues that you want to you know that you actually cover now also because you have your voice i mean you're a host and you're famous and you like which are the main social issues that you focus um now on i think nowadays especially since i've grown up so much in the past few years and there are so many prevalent issues that we really need to give focus on. I think most of my messaging has always been about the youth trying to make this opportunity their their chance to become better or to make the, the, the world a better place. I know this sounds like so beauty queen of me to say, but <laughs> a lot of the youth don't know what to do with their lives, don't know which type of path they want so that they can feel like they are important. And they always look at what's my purpose, what's my purpose. And what I try to do is find a way to help them realize who they are by by pushing them to explore more. And another side of it, other than the youth, was really more on justice and equality. And it didn't matter what type of people they were. If you were the type of person who was oppressed, or if you're a people that was oppressed by any other body, then I would want to be there and help bring out that messaging that you're trying to fight for. Whether it's Stop Asian Hate, or Black Lives Matter, or right now we have um, freedom for Palestine, no matter what the ethnicity or race or religion, I wanted to be on the right side of history. I wanted to be for human rights in general. So it didn't even matter whether it's LGBTQ or, or women because what we're looking for is equality and justice. So that's mostly what I've been trying to put out there. And what do you think? Because, like, uh, of course, um, you know, talking now about Palestinian issue that you know was very fresh. Now, I, I mean, it's a very long story, but of course, I think last months we, the whole community, was very active, and you were also very active on the social media. And we know that in politics, um, very often there are big powers, big money. But do you believe that young generation and that like voices of young people can do make change? For sure, because they're the ones who are really bringing out the truth right now. I've been talking to so many Filipinos in particular who are coming from different generations and you can see the differences in their opinions. The older generation have this 
close well not all of them but most of them have this close-minded image of what is going on in palestine but then the youth they're always inquisitive they always want to see what is the story behind what's going on right now and because of social media they are able to really search for more information and what i feel like this generation has is that that hunger for knowledge it's being used as their power rather than anything else because if you're seen if you're knowledgeable and if you talk about it online then you will be heard that's what they that's what they think right now and it's true it's true knowledge and stories i mean palestinian people what they're looking for what they're asking for people across the world is to help us bring the truth out there to reveal what's going on and that's what social media does and those who are really helping are the youth the right. the power dynamic has been shifted and the story is no longer one-sided because the youth is there to really check and balance mm. yes i also hope that you know the, the, this the truth uh, gonna win and that the use i mean i think use is a future so this is uh, very powerful when they start to talk and what are your main goals now oh my gosh that's a lot that's a heavy question <laughs> to i ask. can imagine i can imagine already <laughs> i'm i mean at this point in my life i'm already 29 about to get into my 30s really soon and i'm just very excited to bring everything that i've learned in my youth you know because in your 20s sometimes you know what you want but then you don't know what you want but now that i'm i'm entering my 30s i have a firm grasp of who i want uh, who i want to be and what type of things i want to achieve and it's no longer just about earning anymore it's no longer about finding the right type of job because now i realize this is what i want to do and the goal here is to really maximize my my knowledge and bringing it to other people and I am not officially saying that I want to get into more political activities because honestly, I'm more for the people rather than a political party. But I do want to get more involved in creating more policies for for people in my country and also speaking out. I've been talking to the Palestinian embassy. How can I help create a dialogue between Filipinos and uh, Palestine because there seems to be a disconnect. There seems to be some some type of misunderstanding between what is a Filipino and what is an Arab because they have a totally different dynamic or relationship. So I really want it to be a bridge. Even in the Philippines as well, other than just multicultural, we also have some, some type of tension between the Christians and the Muslims. And I'm actually Muslim with my father's family being heavily catholic because he was a christian before he converted so i do understand the best of both worlds and all i want to do is just be that connecting bridge between the two cultural cultures two religions two races so that we have more of of a mutual understanding so most of my goals have been towards that other than personal goals like having a family already you know proceeding with getting my business going up because you know during the pandemic it was all about surviving and now it's time to thrive and push forward with um, the things that I want to do in my personal life sure. yeah but in terms of what I want to do for the people that's that's what I'm looking forward to getting into a more in a position that will allow me to not just speak but to really implement certain policies which is one of the reasons why i joined the army you know to really make that happen and not just be a mouthpiece for uh for certain groups or corporations or even individuals yeah and i, and I think what you are talking about like building up the bridges this is the, the best way to actually raise awareness and really to make this world better and um I think that this is a really a right direction to think about, you know, because uh, one thing is to bring up the truth, but uh, also to find the similarities, because it's all, all very, you know, it's usual problem of our world. We are searching for differences, but not the similarities. And, you know, since this year, I also have this um, media cultural bridge with Russia and Palestine. So, and I think this is like, that's what we try also to do. And that's, of course, great that you have the same initiatives in the Philippines. And 
I think we should really work more on finding the similarities and connecting each other than, you know, and I'm happy that our youth is thinking more in this direction. So that's, uh, that's hopeful, let's say. And I, uh, I think it's really interesting that people like you and me and people who have been exposed to different cultures, right? It's usually the people who are mixed or the people who are living or traveling into different cultures who understand that we're not really that different you know and we're the ones who are calling for peace because it's possible we've seen it we've experienced it in our own multicultural world so that's what we want to bring out even you with dialogue that's what you were trying to do even you with trying to bridge also through through sports and um and your initiatives that's what we want to happen and i feel like the more that we allow opportunities for for having an exchange of thoughts and values and looking for the similarities like what you said rather than the differences it will make a huge impact and what can be a solution for both sides and not just one what uh, not just a one-sided approach yeah and as we say about like sports and culture, I think they're like the most uh, powerful tools, you know, like a diplomatic yes. tools to build up those bridges. And talking about the culture, what are your favorite, let's say, um, what do you love the most from Palestinian culture? Because I know in your family you probably still cook Palestinian food and, you know, so some kind of uh, uh, cultural aspects, because kitchen is also in Palestine a big part of the culture. <laughs> 100%. I don't think I can ever get enough of of Palestinian food. Every time it's whenever someone would offer it, I would always say yes. Palestinian food is a must. If I had to choose which is my favorite between Filipino and Palestinian food, I'm sorry Filipinos, but Palestinian <laughs> food has to be my favorite cuz I think it has so much so much to do with my childhood growing up, you know. This was what I called my comfort food. Of course I love Filipino food, but I have to be biased with my Palestinian food. In terms of the culture itself, I think other than, you know, people always talk about the resilience of Palestinians, but they don't understand that there's also a warmth to Palestinians where they really welcome people. And I found that to be my favorite thing because they really do not choose no matter who you are. They would always welcome you. They always want to show you a good time. I've met Palestinians in different parts of the world and they all have the same attitude where, where they are so generous with what they have. They want to share with you food, they want to take the bill away from you and they want to welcome you into their world. <laughs> and that type of welcomeness and generosity is what I find that attracts me also to Filipinos because they're we're known for has hospitality. We're known for being welcoming people and I think that's what I found the most charming about it, that people also misunderstand because they don't know. They always think that Arabs are in general aggressive people, but they are one of the most welcoming and they're only aggressive if they don't want you to pay for the check. Like that's the aggressive <laughs> part, to yeah. be honest. When I said to my European friends that when I was in Palestine, I could not pay anywhere like for food and it was even difficult for me to pay my bill in the hotel, you know? So, and they say, how is it possible? I say, yes, it is completely different uh, mindset, you know, completely in this case. But that's, um, yeah, that's really interesting. And um, like talking more about your personal side, which features do you appreciate the most in people? I think in people in general or in people in a certain culture? In general. Oh, I think that the willingness to learn from a person, someone who's willing to hear your side is such a great quality because it just shows that you are, of course, patient. It shows that you are open-minded. It shows that you want to understand and respect the other person. So I look always for most of my friends, if they don't listen to what I have to say, then, and they cut me off, I feel like we're not going to have a good friendship because I'm a person who will respect no matter what you want to say. You know, I will try to understand your side and then give you my thoughts. If I disagree with you, then it's not something that we need to fight about. But listening, actually listening for the purpose of uh, what I said, which, which is understanding, has a huge factor in what I find in people, what I find attractive in people, um, in friendships and relationships, even in my family. So that is 
what I really love because mm -hmm. it shows a lot of good qualities when you see someone wanting to hear your thoughts and valuing your opinions. Mm -hmm. And um, if, like, if you could choose. Uh, some books that actually made, you know, made, made an impact in your life, oh, which books could it be? Most of the books that I have read are usually fiction because non-fiction stories kind of... It's kind of sad if you know that it's reality, you know, when you hear like really, really sad stories. I, I, I kind of want to look for hope. I always am that type of person who looks for a movie or a book or a series that can teach me something that will be turned into advice. You know, if I see something in a movie and I say, oh, actually, that's a really great way to react to hearing someone saying this then I would take it as advice. And most of the books that I've read are fiction and a lot of Paulo Coelho books because it allows you to open your eyes for different cultures and, uh, and also different types of thinking. That's one. One thing that I've read when I was a young, a young girl is A Child Called It. So that really opened my eyes that there are t abuses against children, against women, and that there are people who really need our help we may not realize that someone is suffering, but we should be able to be sensitive to those type of topics and find a way to help them and be courageous. And A Child Called It is actually based on a real life story. It's from David Pelzer and it's his life when he was younger about abuse, uh, about how he got abused from his mother, but he was still able to find forgiveness and he was still able to find goodness in the world, even if he was experiencing what I would describe as a hellhole, you know? Mm -hmm. And that really has shaped how I understand people and how I should always give um, a light of day or give sensitivity to others So I, because I don't know what type of struggles mm -hmm. they've been going through, you know? And that's how I live my life, to be honest. Like, learning that everybody has a reason for why they are who they are, even if they are quote-unquote bad people or mm -hmm. if they've done something wrong but if you try to find understanding and and try to be open to them rather than fighting it maybe there's a chance that they can go back and yeah. find forgiveness but but that's that brings me to another question because uh, you, you said that you also you were reading Paolo Coelho and then um, and actually, he has a lot of those thoughts in his books. Do you believe in maktub? Do you believe that there is something that is already written to you and that sometimes you have to let go of this control? That's why I read his books, because apparently every book I read, I'm just like, are you sure, Paolo? Are you sure that there's nothing else that I can do for myself? Because yes, it's maktub, but as human beings, we like to still feel like we are in control of our lives. Right? It's hard for us to let go. Maybe we can let go about certain things, but it's hard for us to realize that we can't make everything that we want happen, even if you work so hard. You have to accept that there is a reason behind it, that whatever is meant for you is meant for you for, for a particular reason, whether it's to become better or to learn from it or to help other people. It's not always about you being the star of your own show, but maybe becoming that supporting actress and it's not in your control. So for sure what you're saying about like, do I believe in it? I do believe in it, but I still have that struggle until now <laughs> to sometimes, you know, learn to be like, I totally understand. I have exactly the same problem. So, I mean, it's very close to me what you say. And I think sometimes we have to accept that the universe has a better plan for us. But it yeah. takes a lot of time to really accept it. So, but um, I'm sure that the universe is going to bring you at the end where you should be, in a, you're already there. And um, yeah, so with this learning to trust i think you're going to get even more energy to achieve more goals and more goals and and, and i think already for your age you you have done so much so thank you very much for already everything you did everything you do and i wish you of course all the best luck for the future and um, you never know where your life brings you it might be that your goals from the youth gonna still happen because you're still very young so and um, thank you so much for finding time for this dialogue. It was really a pleasure.
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy that I get to share a little bit of my experience and uh, some of the wisdom that I've learned to your audience. And I hope that I get to meet you very soon. I feel like we have a lot in common. I mean, I'm sure that you experience what I'm saying with the controlling because as an athlete, you know, you have discipline, you plan about what you want to do, but sometimes it's it doesn't happen for you during the competition and that's what we call maktub, right? It's right. it's really not meant for you and um, whether you're an athlete or a beauty queen or even just a normal person, you will find those moments in life where you won't know what's going to happen no matter how, how hard you work, work for yeah. it. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. It's really been a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this and I do look forward to your other episodes. Thank you so much. Thank you.